Welcome back to Dirty Medicine's psychiatry series. In this video, we're going to be talking about major depressive disorders and other related depressive illnesses. Let's talk about some epidemiology before we dive fully into this topic. So major depressive disorder, or MDD for short, affects females more than it does males. And the average age of onset is in the early 20s, and there's a very large genetic association. In major depressive disorder, there are a couple of different hypotheses for why this occurs. And what I'm talking about is pathophysiology. The first hypothesis of major depressive disorder is known as the monoamine hypothesis. And this hypothesis basically says that MDD is the result of depletion of the monoamines. Now, monoamines include things like serotonin or 5-HT, norepinephrine or NE, and dopamine or DA, as you see abbreviated on this slide. And the reason that this hypothesis has such strong evidence is because when you give somebody a drug that increases any of these monoamines, such as your selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs, your serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, or SNRIs, your TCAs or your MAOIs, any of those medications that I just named all increase the monoamines. So if you give a drug that increases monoamines to a patient and suddenly their depressive symptoms get better, then we have a hypothesis that this is because depression or major depressive disorder is due to the depletion of those monoamines. And again, those include serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. The other model is what's known as the stress diathesis model. And this basically says that people or patients will have these genetic predispositions. And in patients with a, a genetic predisposition, those predispositions will be activated by real life stressors. And basically what this model is saying is that there are two hits that have to occur. The first is a genetic vulnerability. So you're born with genes that just, you know, make you more likely to get major depressive disorder. And then there's an environmental hit where let's say that you start college and for the first time in your life, you're completely stressed out and overwhelmed and you're not sleeping and your diet has changed and you're not around your normal support network. Well, that environmental stressor will act as the agent that basically puts these patients over the top in those that have a genetic predisposition. So that's the stress diathesis model. Now these are the two different hypotheses that are probably both to some extent correct for major depressive disorder, but you should be familiar with this pathophysiology if you will. Now let's get into the DSM-5 criteria. So for those of you who are new to psychiatry, the diagnoses in psychiatry are made through what's known as the DSM. And the current edition of the DSM is at DSM-5. So let's talk about the DSM-5 criteria for major depressive disorder. So there's a couple really important things. And the first one is that the symptoms have to be going on for at least two weeks, okay? At least two weeks. And the way that you can remember this is that depression is two blue weeks. And of course, we can contrast that to mania, that is to say mania of bipolar one disorder. And in mania, there's one fun week. So we've got one fun week for mania, but two blue weeks for depression, which means that for major depressive disorder, the symptoms have to be going on for at least two weeks. Now, the next part of the criteria that's really important is that there has to be at least five SIG E CAPS symptoms. And if this is the first time you've heard SIG E CAPS, don't worry, I'm going to break down that mnemonic for you so that you understand what it refers to. So SIG E CAPS or S I G E C A P S are the hallmark symptoms of major depressive disorder that are associated with this disorder. So let's just go through these individually. So the S stands for sleep, I stands for interest, G stands for guilt, E stands for energy, C for concentration. A for appetite, P for psychomotor retardation, and S for suicidality. Now, I'm going to talk about most of these, and I'll leave two out, and we'll come back to the two at the end. So for interest, there's decreased interest in major depressive disorder. For guilt, the patient has guilty feelings or feelings of guilt. For energy, their energy level is going to be decreased. Concentration, they're going to have trouble concentrating. Let's skip uh, skip the A for psychomotor retardation. This means that they're going to be slow. They're going to be sluggish. Their motor, because of their psycho, is retarded, which is to say that because of their mental status, they're moving slowly. And then S, they're going to have suicidal ideation, maybe a plan or intent on acting on that plan. Now, I skipped sleep and I skipped appetite. And the reason that I left these two symptoms 
uh, for the end here is because these can vary in different presentations of major depressive disorders. So in what's known as typical or melancholic depression, there's decreased sleep, so the patient has insomnia, and there's decreased appetite, so they don't eat as much and they don't sleep as much. That's typical or melancholic depression. But there's another type of depression where they actually sleep too much and they eat more. And this is known as atypical depression. So typical versus atypical depression really is differentiated by either sleeping too much versus too little and eating too much versus too little. Okay, so sleep and appetite will differentiate typical from atypical depression. Uh, major depressive disorder. So keep that in mind. It's really important. But to summarize the DSM-5 criteria, two blue weeks, so at least five SIG cap symptoms for at least two weeks, that's major depressive disorder. Now, since we're talking about depression, there are other depressive illnesses that oftentimes get lumped in with major depressive disorder, but aren't actually major depressive disorder per se. And now we're going to talk about those other types of depression. So recall that you can have depression in your patients with bipolar disorder. So whether they have bipolar one, where they've had a manic or psychotic episode related to their bipolar symptoms, they still go through phases of depression in their lifetime. Same for bipolar two, whether they're hypomanic or not, they're going to have times of their life where they just seem depressed. And if you look at them, you would never be able to differentiate whether their depression is major depressive disorder or whether their depression is bipolar depression, because all you're seeing in front of you are SIG ECAP symptoms. Dysthymia is basically at least two years of SIG ECAP symptoms, but less than five of them. So recall that in major depressive disorder, you have to have at least five SIG ECAP symptoms. But if you never make it to that threshold, and it goes on for at least two years, you have dysthymia. So this is a little bit of depression, not yet major depression because you don't have five SIGI cap symptoms, but it goes on for a very long time and it's at least two years. A depressive episode is less than two weeks of SIGI cap symptoms. It really doesn't matter how many you have. As long as you have some elements of, of the SIGI cap symptoms and the patient feels depressed, it's just a depressive episode. We've got substance induced. so. The big one is stimulant withdrawal. So things like cocaine or PCP or methamphetamine, anything that's activating or sympathomimetic, when you withdraw from it, you'll feel depressed. So as a principle, whatever the intoxication state is like for a drug, the withdrawal state is the opposite. So imagine a stimulant. It really ramps you up, gives you a lot of energy, makes you do things, talk really fast, feel like you're on top of the world. If that's what it's like to be intoxicated on a stimulant, then what do you think it's like when you withdraw from a stimulant? Well, the opposite of that is depression. So these patients look depressed, but they're not actually having major depressive disorder. They're just withdrawing from cocaine. Schizoaffective disorder, depressed type, remember that these patients are only going to be depressed when they're psychotic, but, when, but they can still be psychotic and not be depressed. And that should be differentiated from major depressive disorder with psychotic features in which the patient can have psychotic episodes, but only when they're depressed. And of course, they'll have times where they're depressed, but not be psychotic. So I've highlighted all of that information really quickly in blue text here, but this is the differential if you will, for major depressive disorder. Now let's transition and talk about the treatment for depression. So as a principle, an overview, if you will, the treatment is going to consist of some combination of these medications. So you've got your SSRIs, your SNRIs, the atypical antidepressants, your TCAs, or your monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Now, because we're talking about depression and the bread and butter treatment or first line treatment of depression is SSRIs, that's what we're going to focus on in this video. So I want to talk about the mechanism of the SSRIs because it does come up in questions. So what I want to show you is a slide where you've got a picture of a neural junction. And what you see here is a vesicle shown in blue and inside of that vesicle is serotonin. So those little red circles, those are basically serotonin molecules. And what happens is that the vesicle is going to move toward the end and it's going to dump that serotonin into the junction. And that serotonin is going to bind to its postsynaptic serotonin receptor shown there where the little red stuff meets the postsynaptic 5-HT or serotonin receptor. Now how SSRIs work is that in order for this process to stop, the serotonin has to be uh, re-uptaken back 
into the presynaptic neuron. So what you see here is reuptake. There's a serotonin reuptake channel and that serotonin that's now in the synapse is gonna move through that channel back into the presynaptic neuron where it can be packaged back into vesicles and the process can continue. So how SSRIs work is that they inhibit this process. So if an SSRI comes to this channel and basically locks off or closes the channel, then serotonin cannot be reuptaken back into the presynaptic neuron and therefore serotonin stays in the synapse and continuously activates the postsynaptic serotonin receptor. So when it's doing that, it's exerting the effect of serotonin. And one of the effects of serotonin is to help the symptoms of depression. So to summarize, SSRIs block the reuptake of serotonin, therefore keeping serotonin in the synapse, therefore continuously stimulating the postsynaptic serotonin receptor and preventing it from being reuptaken back into the presynaptic neuron. So that's how SSRIs work. And if you introduced an SNRI or a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, it would work the same way. It would just act on both the serotonin reuptake channel and the norepinephrine reuptake channel. So this is a brief glimpse into the pharmacology of how these agents work and how they treat depression. But that's it for this video. So just to summarize, we've talked about major depressive disorder. We've talked about the differential of major depression. We've talked about the treatment for depression, and we've also touched a little bit on epidemiology and the pathophysiology or hypotheses of why depression occurs.